everybody. Today I'm going to talk about uh, the work that we did in Alaska when I was at Angler Gold between 2002 and 2006. And for me, it was an exciting period of exploration. I had to learn a lot. I'd never worked in the tundra before, particularly that close to the Arctic Circle. Um, come on, why won't the slide move? Okay. Um, the area we focused on in Alaska was uh, was gold in the Tintina Belt. Or sorry, the Tintina Gold Belt. It's a, an intrusion-related set of gold deposits that run from the Yukon in Canada right to Alaska up to just beyond Fairbanks. Um, we had two projects there. One was called the Gobi Project, which was adjacent to the Pogo to Pogo Mine. At that stage, Pogo wasn't a mine yet. And the other is the Lavengood project. The Pogo project uh, continued through um, till Anglo abandoned Alaska in 2005 and 2006. And the Lavengood project was given to the manager for North America at the time, Jeff Pontius, and they continued working on it through a company, that junior company they formed called International Tower Mines. And today, International Tower Mines still exists. And the Live and Good project has gone through a pre-feasibility and they're sitting with a relatively low grade 0.7 gram a ton ore body, but they've got 8.97 million ounces in the ground. Um, and they are quite confident they're going to get that thing moving in the next year or two. But it was the end of the era, era in Anglo Gold. At that stage, around about 2005 and 2006, virtually the entire top echelon of senior geologists in Anglo Gold walked out. There were many reasons for it. And one is that there was a change in, of, of senior management. And Anglo Gold's view of Greenfields exploration in particular uh, was very low. They wanted to buy projects rather than find them. And I was rather concerned because when I left Anglo Gold in 2006, I was never replaced. Now, it didn't worry me in any other way that I felt very strongly about geochemists. Now I discovered that many other mining companies had no longer got ge chief geochemists. And in Canada was a rather renowned Canadian geochemist, exactly the godfather of world geochemistry. He a, was a consultant. And if anybody's ever used Amos standards, Barry Smee was the guy who, who accredited them. So he's a fairly eminent fellow. And I wrote to him saying I was very concerned about the demise of geochemists. And his reply to my email is something I've never forgotten. He said, however, the sad fact of life is that the regular when reported data, sorry, are not compliant to so state of best practices, and consequently, uh, consequently, many reports are just a joke. The legal entity 43101, now 43101 is a similar to our SAMRE code, it's a Canadian mining code, and they refer to a competent person as the QP or a qualified person. If something goes wrong, he said, is a QP is responsible for it all. But the more important point was that he said that the geochemist category is being phased out to lexicon here in Canada. And there are few of us left and no schools producing applied geochemists and few schools actually have any courses at all. Those of us who remember the 70s and the 80s will remember that there were three great schools of geochemistry in the world. One was Queen's University in, uh, uh, in Kingston, Ontario. Colorado School of Mines under Grand Cross and our own Cape Town University School of Geochemistry. And to the best of my knowledge, the last student produced by Cape Town was in about 2002 or 2003. So we don't really have trained applied geochemists anymore. Anyway, um, I was very concerned about this. And if you look at this particular graph here, what I've got here is a primary search method for gold at the prospect scale since 1900 to the present day. What was the way they found to drill the first borehole? And you see this area in green here? That's the role played by geochemistry. It's always been a major component of gold exploration. The other major component of this, this blue area, which is the prospectus. And if you notice their role, has died out as time gone by because no longer are gold deposits easy to find. The persistence that they used to have is now controlled by stock markets. They were unregulated in those days. Today, everyone is regulated. And in their day, the drainages were unpolluted. It's one of the big problems we have in geochemistry is that streams are badly polluted by all kinds of things, notably fertilizer. 
So that is the basis on which we went to Alaska. The area we worked in in Alaska is this Fairbanks area. There is the Arctic Circle. This line running south here is the border between the Yukon of Canada and Alaska. And this area here that we worked in here is, an, is a Paleoproterozoic area of rocks that run between two major faults, the Denali Fault in the southwest and the Tentina Fault in the northeast. And in between these two faults are the areas that we were interested in. Uh, there's the Canadian-Alaskan border. There's Fairbanks. <coughs> There's a town of Whitehorse. This map is produced by TSC et al. in 2016. It's not actually a gold map. It's a map relating to lead zinc deposits, but it's the best one I can find um, that show the, the, the rocks. And the most important rocks to us are these Neoproterozoic to Mississippian, and for those who don't know American geology and Mississippians, early Carboniferous rocks. These are continental margin assemblages and they schists and masses. And this is a very old map produced by Goldfarb in 1997, but I, I like it because it shows what we were dealing with. Here is Fairbanks over here. Our Gobi project was down here, and this, is, this line here is 50 kilometers, uh, is down here. And the one project we had, the Gobi project, was right adjacent to the Pogo deposit. And our Lavengood project, and the one that still exists to this day, is up here in the north of Fairbanks. There were two mines in the area at that stage of importance. One is Fort Knox, which was the sort of the start, the mine that started this all. And then Pogo came in around about 2006, 2007, at the end of our era in Alaska. This here is what Fort Knox looks like from the air. It's a heap leach operation. There's the open pitch. It's a fairly mature operation. They've got two heaps. And in typical uh, American style of mining, they put a big primary crusher, quite amazing things to see, right on the edge of the open pit, and then move whatever they have to move around towards the mill and then into to various heap leaches. Now, if you look at this is a fairly low grade deposit. I mean, this is really low grade. When you consider we're mining seven grams a ton at Paul Reese, this is 0.36 grams a ton, but they've got a fair tonnage of ounces. And today, heap leach works particularly well in getting gold out of these low-grade deposits. But it's mostly in paleoproterozoic cysts of primary sedimentary origin. It's bounded by the north of the Tentina Fault system and on the south by the Denali Fault. And on, as in all these Alaskan deposits, the plutonic origin is ascribed to the gold, which occurs in veins and vein swarms. And in the case of Alaska, they're fairly uh, uh, disseminated. But in this one, it's not. This is the Pogo deposit. You'll see there are actually two major veins that they mine. And this mine is now owned by Northern Star, who bought it from Tech Sumintomo in 2018. And this is a fairly good grade of 10.8 grams per ton. And again, it's, it's in gnosis and schists from, uh, from uh, Proterozoic to mid Paleozoic age. And here they've actually dated the mineralization at 104 million years. The gold again is in sulfide veins, but the important part of this is this bismuth tellurium component, which helped us in exploration, and we therefore introduced a system of multi-element analysis. It was still in its early years, but it worked very, very well for us, and I'll show, explain it to you in a minute. But you can see Pogo runs at a fairly high grade compared to Fort Knox. It's 13.6 gram, grams a ton, and it's 4 million ounces, but they have two single veins rather than a whole lot of disseminated veins. So this is the sort of background in which we went into Alaska. And my job was applied to chemistry. I went, I was working on several projects at the same time in Peru, in Colombia, in Brazil, in Russia, and also in Alaska. And there was also quite a lot of work that we were doing around Marilla in West Africa. So I was kept fairly busy. I actually spent most of 2002 to 2006 in an aeroplane. Um, this geochemistry started in 2002 uh, when I was handed a whole lot of data and I'll show you the data in a moment and what we discovered was the first problem we had in Alaska was substandard laboratories in Fairbanks. The point here is that these substandard laboratories weren't just any fly-by-night operations, they were the major commercial labs and there were two of them that performed extremely badly and it had nothing to do for lab management. It was a peculiar thing and I'll explain it to you in a minute. The other components was improving assay quality and QAQC management on any project that I work at any time in my life as a geochemist, I 
spent a huge amount of time on this. And that includes laboratory auditing. I've probably audited about 300 laboratories since I worked in this field of exploration geochemistry. The other component is, is when you're dealing with operations like this, particularly in remote areas, sample handling, sample logistics, and laboratory turnaround are key. So that has to be managed and facilitated. And I spend a lot of time doing this. Rather than having a geologist go and fight for the labs, I do it for them. And, and that way, we work far, far better, and we got what we wanted. But then there was the actual work, and this is what I'm going to focus on today. It's just, we, there's improving soil and stream sediment sampling, stream sediment sampling techniques. Now I'm going to show you a stream sediment sampling technique, which has sort of died. Actually, I've never published anything on this, and I should do, because it is actually an extremely good way of prospecting for gold. And I did a lot of evaluation of soil sampling, which meant understanding the, the, the tundra regolith, and then the last bit, which is a, I spend, seem to spend most of my time these days working on, is evaluation and reverse circulation drilling. It has its own problems with sampling, and if that sampling is not managed, you can produce, particularly with gold, can produce the most awful results with it. Anyway, this started off with this invalid geochemistry of the rock samples. What happened was the gold, gold assay fraction did not match the sample fraction for multi-element analysis. The sample will be divided into two. You'll see this table is a red line going down it. This is the goal that's sent off the assay, and this is all the multi-element analyses. Those are two separate fractions. We got the results back that didn't match, and I'll show you in this uh, uh, table in a minute exactly what I'm talking about. But we, when we went back and looked at the reserve portion, which our consulting geologists, we employed a team of consulting geologists to help us in the field. When we employed, when we went back to look at the lab pulp sample numbers, they did not match the sample numbers that we had in the field. All field rock IDs are correct. We've actually a ground truth to everything. And clearly two consignments of rock samples have been badly comp compromised by sample numbers and sample fractures being jumbled. And if you look at this data, there's data here for a quartz vein that has the composition of a nice, not a vein. And if you go through this data, you'll see that there are three samples. One is a quartzite, one is a, other two are cysts, but they all got roughly the same geochemistry. There's another three, two cysts and a quartz vein, all the same geochemistry. Another quartz vein <coughs> with the geochemistry of this lot over here, and one of them has got high gold, and all three of these samples have got high gold. And if I never worked at Anglo American Research Laboratories, I would have never understood what happened. The same thing happened with a bunch of samples we brought in from Saudi other gold mine in the early days to Anglo Labs, field samples. I brought them in and I discovered the same pattern in the analyses. What the crusher house had been doing, and I don't know how many years they'd been doing this, but they'd been crushing one sample. <coughs> and instead of putting that sample into a single sample bag, they put it into the next three samples. So you did this it would be sample one, but these which the sample two and three in actual fact would be given the pulp of sample one. And they never even bothered to crush these two samples. And so it went on. And this is exactly what is happening in here. Anyway, I went into this laboratory and I audited it. Well, this is the laboratory where crosses are, all kinds of things. And uh, Ed Cadel, who knows me well and who's known me when I've ordered laboratories, knows that I freak out when I see cluttered laboratories. Laboratories should not be cluttered. In fact, Ed being here, this is the SGS lab in Johannesburg. Where Ed actually worked. Look at it. It's organized, it's tidy. This is what our lab should look like. Not this clutter with ladders in the way, benches, uh, dust. The dust, there was a, this place had never been dusted. And when we caught operators uh, spitting a sample from like this, this is not, uh, you do not split a sample like this. A hopper is a, a device to split a sample in half equally. So you use the whole width. You don't pour the sample down the middle of it, especially from a piece of false cap paper. <coughs> anyway, we did a full investigation, and I yeah, was usually impressed with the commercial laboratory involved. They brought in senior management, and together we ordered to this place. And when you're in a remote place like Fairbanks, and particularly in the US, you find all kinds of things. And what we found in this laboratory was that <coughs> somehow <coughs> they deployed their friends from Fairbanks, and we it was a, a nest of drug addicts. Cocaine users like you cannot believe. They had to guys. fire the entire staff. Okay. So that was the first thing. Then, because we were using a, a variety of commercial labs and we were employing this new multi-element technology, we needed to, to test it. And this is uh, SGS, ALS, all offer it. It's a 48-element technique. In the early days, 
<coughs> he didn't know what his performance was like. We've since found it's probably the most useful analytical technique in explorations to be produced. What it is, is either an aqua or the one I prefer, which is a hard, four acid, which uses four acids to dissolve the entire sample, it's called a total digestion. And then using a combination of optical emission spectrographs and uh, uh, mass spectrographs, we're using our, an sorry? Using an inductively coupled plasma uh, introduction of the sample into the instrument, you can get these hugely accurate analyses or they very, very good. And I'm not going to go into detail these graphs, but I assessed the whole lot of them in three laboratories using these five or six highly specialized samples, produced about 8,000 graphs and gave both the techniques a complete bill of health and found the only thing that contributed to the variation of the sample was the sample itself and not the analytical technique. So we applied all this technology in, in Alaska and off we went. And the very first thing we did was start uh, looking at the Gobi project, which is the one next to Pogo. This is a drilling operational hill. All of this operation, I work for helicopters. Uh, to me, the most powerful transport tool in geochemistry is a helicopter. There is our top of there. In this case, we're using a Bell Ranger. This is what the shifts look like that host for gold. And the very first thing we did, here's the Gobi project, here's Pogo Mine. In this particular area of Shaw Creek, we did a stream sediment orientation study. And that was introduced to introduce this new technique of stream sediment sampling. Stream sediment sampling on gold is based on the assumption that you get places or uh, nuggets of gold in drainages. That's the, uh, and, and, and as the years have gone by, the gold has got finer and finer. And we introduced, or years ago, probably in the 50s and 60s, the minus 80 mesh technique of prospecting for gold. But in my view, it was a hit and miss method. There's a far, far better method for prospecting on gold, and it was based on the microscopic studies that I did at Anglo Research Labs. And it's totally independent of us, two other geochemists, a guy by the name of uh, uh, Guy Fletcher, who was with the uh, British Columbia Survey, and Richard Mazzucchelli, an Australian geochemist, started to develop similar approaches. But this is the one <coughs> we did in, we developed in Peru, where it's first worked. But it's based on this model. If you look at this table here, you see all it is, is a microscopic study of 1,002 gold grains in a, a, a head sample. Now, working in Anglo Labs, you had access to a metallurgical laboratory, so we could actually get head samples to do this. So this is a Volris head sample, and I measured all the gold grains I could find in that head sample until I got to 1,000. And one of the grains there counted for 96% of the grade. So you had 1,000 grains. And only one of them, because it's the biggest of the lot, and you use volume calculations, this is the volume of the sphere, to do, to do this. And you discover that you've got a lot of gold grains, but you've got only one grain that accounts for a lot. And this is what it would look like if it was in a, an alluvial deposit, and that's a, that square is one millimeter, they're quite coarse. <coughs> and they are very difficult to find. They, of course, there's just one here and one there. And if you put them in a sample together, as we did in this case, we found something all unusual. When we moved them, they formed little sausages, but that is actually two grains, so you make them even bigger. And when I put one of these grains in a scanning electron microscope, I found that the mill had actually enlarged the grains. So you're making the problem even worse. So you've now got a pulp drop with coarse gold in it. And this is what happens when you've got coarse gold. This, this is the model. This box here is a five kilogram geological sample. It's very likely at the grades we're dealing with to have two gold grains in it. Now we are going to crush that up, make a pulp, fine grain pulp, and we're going to assay the pulp. These little pictures are each of a fire assay crucible of which you put 30 grams in. The chances of you doing 18 analyses and getting the grade that you want is one or two out of 18. That is how we calculated it. So you are actually going to, if you do one analysis on a stream sediment sample, um, you are likely to have one chance in 18 of actually hitting the gold in the sample if it's there. So we decided that there must be another way of doing it and go for the fine gold. And we discovered it was a very, very sensitive technique, but it required very careful sample collection. It's very labor intensive, but it works. We use it in the Andes where the guys got to climb up quite steep slopes to sample. It can use standard SA, SA techniques. <clears throat> we use the ALS laboratories in uh, Peru. We used the ALS, the, this MES61, and this was in the early 2000s when it was still in its early days of development. We could also you do aqua regia gold rather than fire assay because the gold is fine enough and is liberated. 
it is actually a low cost technique despite it being labor intensive and it has few logistical problems once we worked out how to do it and it requires screening to minus 75 micron in the field and using a flock unit and the river water is not guarded so in other words the water is kept until all the gold is got out so that's the finest the fine gold in peru in the andes with the collecting 10 up to 10 samples a day <clears throat> this is how it's done you screen into a bag Having been associated with the beers people, the screen was based on the screens that the beers have been using for years. We use a drum clamp and I make the screen out of a Teflon pipe. And this is us screening in the field. <clears throat> and there is a fine fraction, minus 75 uh, 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 <clears throat> microns. The little cup below the one side there contains magnaflock, which is the flocculant. You put a cap full in there, it separates everything out. And that is the fraction that gets sent to the laboratory get set in that little Tupperware container with still with the water in and then the lab will dry it they will dry the sample and that is how it goes to the lab that's what we did in Alaska we took it along to Alaska and we tested it but before that I did an orientation said you had no idea how the drainages worked so we used the chopper and that's the areas I showed you earlier where we actually operated and this is the kind of model that I use for working out drainages. You have first, second, and third order drainages starting at the top of the slope, working downwards to the major drainages. And there is it done from the air. This is the Corder Creek, Shaw Creek area, which was on the map. And I did a full analysis. There were dozens of these photographs produced. And you will see that Wherever you look, we've actually been able to understand the drainages. To see them from the air close up uh, uh, is much easier and you can therefore identify areas where to sample, like I've done in this photograph. Uh, today I would use a drone. I don't think I'd use a helicopter in all cases. And we marked the areas where to sample beforehand and the crews would just go to those good reference points. It also required looking at the, the sediment in the drainage. Now this is the tundra. This is where there is not much rock weathering. There's not much sludge in a river. We've got to struggle to find the stuff. And a lot of it is glacial dust, which is a lower type of lowest, which actually contaminates both the soils and the stream sediments. And we had to find a way of getting a suitable sample to, 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 to uh, uh, send to the laboratory. And these two geologists, Ryan Cross and Steve Hovis, they have uh, a consultancy that we use, Northern Associates. They work very well with us. And they screened in the field and sent uh, quite a much larger sample to uh, the local laboratories for further screening. They don't have the labor in the US that we had in Peru or anywhere else. But this was uh, where we hit the jackpot. The USGS got an anomaly very close to this. It was about six or seven meters away where they got their sample of 20 ppb. Using our technique, we got 556 ppb. And throughout the whole area, you know, our anomalies were at least uh, uh, 20 times bigger than the conventional minus 80 mesh sampling that they use in the rivers. It also required a lot of uh, dealing with these meandering drainages because here the, 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 the profile of the sediment is more contaminated by this glacial dust than further slope. So to work out where to sort of get the best sample was a, a major undertaking. And you can see we land this chopper in the riverbed and this area here is where we just get this very small amount of sediment that would be sampled and screened. And that is how we did this. Uh, it took me about two weeks to work all this out and then we put the crews in and they went off and sampled. It's not easy to locate the sampling sites and I think the most important point I need to make is this dilution by lowest, glacial lowest, it obscures anomalies. And sampling has to be done at the time of the year when the flow is the slowest. So it, often you're working uh, 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 early in the season when the, when the thaw sets in. That was a very useful study. We got a lot of uh, a good data from the stream sediment sampling and quite a lot of anomalies from that went on to be sampled by soil sampling. But the story here is, is, is much more interesting. This was more of an adventure than a, 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 a technical soil sampling exercise in the end. But this is what I'd be doing. I'd be investigating each soil, the pits that we'd make, and they'd have three kinds of sample. It'd be a rock or chip sample, be a matic or in shovel. This is a matic, this American call this a matic. 
and they have a very nice soil, which has got a quite narrow for digging nice little holes. But you can see what the, the, the soil looks like. It's full of bits of rock. And this, you are walking on a carpet of moss. The whole country is covered by the soft moss. It's like walking on a carpet. But in some places, the, 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 the soil is quite deep. And we decided probably the best place to sample. This is a profile. Here's the moss, here's the soil, and here's the bedrock. That might be the best place to sample is here and use an auger. Probably the augers that they mix the sample up. They, they tend to act a bit like a cement mixer. So we, we, we did two samples to test, again, orientation studies, an auger sample and a shovel sample to see which was the best. And we produced these maps. I'm not going to go into show you exactly how they did it work. But my major problem was, was the way they gray com compared bismuth to gold to tellurium because they've got different values. Bismuth is much lower than the gold, and tellurium is considerably higher than the gold, and so many other. Uh, uh, so I replotted the stuff, and instead of plotting the values, I plotted the percentiles. This is how I plot data. Because then you can compare copper, which runs at two to 300 ppm, against gold, which runs at uh, 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 one to five to 10 ppm. And we found that the anomalies now become absolutely more uh, uh, identical. They're the copper values, and there are, are the gold values. This is the map they originally gave me, and I was very unhappy with it. I was also very unhappy with the way they sampled because they don't stick to a grid. They change the grid direction, so the, uh, uh, the sampling becomes biased. I prefer to always keep the same uh, orientation when doing soil sampling. Uh, it, 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 it stops you missing or misunderstanding the anomalies because if you look at the later development of this, which I don't unfortunately have the slides yet, I'm still in Alaska. Um, the, 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 the best anomaly is actually not shown on here. They found it later. If they'd sampled properly, they would have found it much earlier. But this is a story I want to tell you, which was the most amazing thing that I've ever had happen while in a soil sampling exercise. I don't know if anybody's ever read this book, Chicken Hawk. It's about the chopper pilots in Vietnam. They're probably amongst the bravest of the brave, these guys. They fly into war zone. Down into the war areas. And if you go to YouTube, you'll see the a Rolling Stones song, Give Me Shelter, played while these choppers are flying into action. It's the most amazing uh, uh, sight to see these choppers going. But anyway, this is what happened. I was actually doing a soil sample evaluation here. I was working with this chopper. This is an R44 chopper, it's a bit smaller. And the guy standing in there is the guy by the name of Tommy Thompson. He's a Vietnam War vet. He flew these choppers in. Vietnam, during the Vietnam War, the delightful man, uh, a guy that uh, uh, he, he was very unassuming, but can this guy fly a chopper? What happened was, in 2004, and I've got the maps of these Alaskan fires taken from the satellites, and yeah, they were bad in 2004 and 2015. The muskeg and the forests catch fire during the summer in Alaska, and this is what they look like. They are huge fires. They make our fires in the Western Cape look like small bonfires. And this is what kind of stuff you're dealing with. You can see in the background. And these are the rescue choppers. They've got special rescue choppers. We got a call that there was a fire here on this particular project. This is our ER drill project. The field camp is down low. I don't have a photograph. It's down low of the hill. But as you see, as you go down the hill, there's forest. And not. Here on the top of the hill, there was nothing. And this is what it looked like in the fires. Same field camp. We got a call. This is... The Pogo mine, around the mine, was the, 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 just to show you what these fires look like. And this is the fire taken from the camp by the two geologists who are on the site. We had to go and rescue these two guys. And this is the, the, what it looked like. And you'll see here the, the skeleton that was after the fire had run through. These guys are in serious danger. I had the camera. I was sitting in the top of a passenger seat. And I got opportunity to see what it was like to fly in Vietnam. With us in the air were two young rescue pilots who had never seen this kind of service. And they wouldn't go in. They could not go through the smoke, which is in this photograph here. And the way he went in was he said, this is how you do it. And he, went, he took the chopper right down the side of the hill and he went up the side of the hill like this and he landed. Now this chopper is a smaller than the They had drill ranges and we had the smaller R44. We put the guys in and we flew out. And to me, this is the most amazing flying I've ever seen. As we went up the hill, you can see us going here, the trees are just underneath the chopper in this heavy smoke. We landed and we picked these guys up and this is what it looked like the next morning. So someday soil sampling gets very, very interesting. 
The other work that we did was uh, once we found these uh, gold anomalies, we started drilling and we put in uh, 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 RC drill rigs. You can see everything has signs, those, everything's designed for snow. I learned to ride one of these things, they're quite fun. And this is the drill rig, and these are my last few slides. One of the big problems I have with, with RC drilling is the cyclone over here and the splitting. They normally split, they take a, a a meter sample, which is about 50 to 70 kilograms, <coughs> and they split it through a series of riffle splitters down to 12 percent, 12 and a half percent. My problem is that the riffle splitter is this wide. I showed you in the labs again, is this wide, and this thing just drops the stuff straight through, as you can see in the next slide. So, just there, they're not using the with the splitter. <coughs> and the other problem is they're making dust, dust dilutes the matrix. And what I would uh, 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 over the years, I've discovered that the sample loss due to dust from the beginning of the sampling operations, RC drilling, to the end of the assay in a lab, they are losing up to 10% of the sample, and they're actually enriching it in gold, which is not a really a good idea, because particularly if you're using RC drilling for resource estimation, you can overestimate the sample slightly, and it creates biases, unnecessary biases. So the, I spent a lot of work on the RFC rigs. We just redesigned these whole things based on the Australian rigs, which are suitably done. And at the point that we pulled out, we were actually going to bring in uh, one of these cones with us. Um, and uh, I don't know what happened after that because we left the whole particular project. And that more or less was the end of my days in Alaska. Today, you can see there's Longwood, our Longwood project. There's Fort Knox, there's Pogo. These, this is the area that we worked in. But you can see as you cross into the border into Yukon, there are a huge number of gold deposits that have suddenly developed these yellow areas, including the Capstone Minto deposit and the Western Copper deposits. So in the end, Tower Minerals took over the Lionwood project. It's a great promising project. As I said, it's 8.97 million ounces, but there's still no mine. And that's a long time now, 15 years without the mine starting. And I think it's a low grade that gets investors worried. And the large Gobi project uh, eventually became a JV between running Fox Resources and Anglo Gold Ashanti. And there's nothing there anymore. Um, the Canadian Stock Exchange is no more running Fox Resources. And we, I can see no evidence of any work going on on that particular project. And that is the end of my story. Thank you very much for listening. Um, and if there are any questions, I'm prepared to answer them. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Keith. You. It was great. Well, Thanks. And the microphone on again, and we can uh, take questions for Keith. Thanks, Keith. So, so, so my, my quick question, and first of all, um, you didn't let me introduce you, but I think your fame and fortune precede you, so we don't, won't introduce you now. But, but when I hear, hear your presentation, Keith, how, how many gold mines have actually been missed out there? John, this is my problem. Um, one of the things that, uh, that, that, that oh, uh, nice. we, we went through the presentation last night, I cut out a lot of, 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 of this talk. One of the things that concerns me is that ge geochemistry plays a huge role in, in gold exploration. But there are so few geochemists who, are, who have got the experience in gold exploration that one is wondering that they're not walking over these things. Um, the most successful people at in gold exploration, the present time is Chinese. Sorry? I'm just going to mute you all again because we're getting interference from people discussing in the background. Someone's. Let's just unmute Keith again. Keith, just unmute. Okay, there we go. I have a music. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. we go. Yeah. Okay. My, my problem is, and I think Ed will bear me out on this, is there are precious few geochemists left in the world, particularly ones who've got the background or the training in understanding the various uh, uh, ways of, of, of um, and areas in which prospecting is done. The basic methods that they still use, soil sampling and uh, steam sediment sampling, Rock chips hopefully oh, haven't changed. We might have refined them, but in the end, we're still looking for gold. But what has really enhanced the work that we do is the various analytical techniques 
that we've developed. And one is the level of accuracy, which we can now assay for gold, down to 0 0.01 part per billion, which is usually a very small amount of gold. But if you're looking for an anomaly. Okay, carry on, we've got you. If you're, look, if you're looking for an anomaly, um, the only way you are going to find it is to sample and assay, sample and assay. And what happens with these projects is they have a budget meeting and they say, how far have you guys got with this project? You say, we're still doing the soil sampling, we're still doing the stream sediment sampling. And the next question is, haven't you started drilling yet? You can't just draw these projects. There's a lack of persistence. And this is because of the, all these projects are investor driven. The number of junior mining companies that run out of money way before they even develop the project is huge. Okay. And this is, the, this is where the problem lies. People do not uh, understand uh, that you can find gold, you actually got to be persistent. Uh, Guy, Guy Fremantle has, a, has a, a suggestion on how to check labs. Guy, can you talk to us and un un unmute yourself? Hello, Amy. Hi. Just unmute yourself, Guy. There we go. Okay. Can you hear All me right. now? Yeah. Thanks. I thought that was fascinating. I, I just missed the first 10 minutes, but um, one of the ways that we dealt with the labs is we, it was a project in Namibia. We went to an abandoned mine nearby and got a few hundred kilos of their tailings. Um, it was the Khan mine, if anybody knows it. And we then split that up and we inserted those as our own sort of CRM because the labs can recognize a CRM and they can recognize blanks. And they also recognize the pattern in which you insert them. So we, we figured out a way in Excel how to give our homemade sample a random number so the lab never knew and it looked like ordinary rock. And we used that to just make sure um, that we were getting uh, uh, believable assays. Have you ever done something like that? No, no the whole world's changed since then. First of all, the labs, you want to use uh, certified reference materials because that is what the stock exchange demand. So to use a homemade standard is actually unacceptable because it, it will vary itself. It has its own nugget effects. These standards, which are prepared like the AMOS standards, the standards used by geostats, those have they've been they've actually been accredited by an, an, a, a qualified accreditor or somebody like Barry Smee. So what you do is the whole new process of doing this. The labs will recognize that you stand in your head. They will recognize a standard. And in fact, they are too busy to worry about that. I can promise you. The big yeah. commercial lab is Ed Cadle will bear me out on this. I mean, I've ordered to 300 labs. I know exactly how they work. If you put in standards uh, uh, in there, they can recognize them. That standard will be recognized because it comes in a sachet, whereas your sample is a rock or it's RC material. They're going to, that standard has to go in there. And you have to put in at least 10% of your samples have to be that standard. 5% have to be blanks, which is really the best standard. That is your hidden standard, the blank. That, has, that, that is the only standard, and that you also can buy now. Um, that is guaranteed blank, um, and that will is also can be certified. And then there are the various duplicates. There's the pulp duplicates, and the lab recognizes those as well. And then the course uh, 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 crush duplicates as well. So you've got all those things. So you're sitting between 20 and 25% of the songs right. that the lab are assaying for you today are actually QAQC materials. That is how strict that they are. So if you put in a, a hidden standard, or I'll put a stop to those type of standards, homemade standards, oh, in early 2001 already, because they actually are, they, have, they haven't been properly homogenized. And that is the issue. A standard has to be properly homogenized. So you will find now, uh, there's a company called Rock Labs in New Zealand, which makes a standard where they actually do not use natural gold. They actually use, they, they take a, a blank pulp and they add gold to it. And that thing is what the labs use as a lot of their standards. And those things are highly repeatable. The uh, commercial standards, their repeatability is also quite high. I've got all the data for all the AMOS standards. They are darn good, considering, but they screen those things so fine that only the fine gold goes in there, so they get no nugget effect. The trouble is with standards that you put in from your, your own source, unless they're ultra powerful pulverized, you will have a nugget effect. So you'll get a variation in grade. Um, and that's yeah, the I, problem. No, I get that. We had all the blanks and we had duplicates. We had drill site duplicates, mm. pulp duplicates, mm. but. We just put our own mm. one and it was slimes. And that's why we thought it would work because it was 
it was fine already. And it was very consistent, actually, when we got all our results back. But well, it's interesting that it's not used. Years. When you consider that yeah. ALS, Joburg at what stages, and SGS are analyzing, you know, they, they have analyzed almost a million samples a year. They haven't yeah. got the time to work out who's got standards and blanks and cheat. They do not cheat. And let me tell you, if I catch a lab cheating, the whole industry will know about it, and they will not get custom, and they know it. So don't expect, this is not the old Anglo research labs where they were a law to themselves, those old company research labs. That can't happen. Mm. These are commercial labs. They are there to make money and they got to keep their integrity. If they get yeah. caught, and they've been caught on many things. You know, I've had labs have their websites hacked by clients so that they can actually see what on the, was on the project next door. This happened in wow. Canada. Well, come on, Keith, that's, that's like the good old days. I mean, we need a bit of life and spice in this industry as well. Otherwise, it gets yeah. boring. Yeah. And Adrian, <laughs> are you? You know, I could give it. Okay, Sorry. let's get some other discussion. What about Adrian? Let's get Adrian's input on gold exploration and how he would be doing it. Are you there? We didn't, do, we didn't do too much stream sampling um, in, in Mali and West, West Africa, Africa in general. Um, yeah. But I mean, I agree 100% with Keith. Um, you, you, you've got to understand what you're doing. And so many people just go through this, oh, well, everybody does it this way and they don't check up the, um, the QAQC properly. And uh, yeah, labs always know when you're sending a, uh, a standard in. Um, they know where the blanks are because obviously they're, they're rocks as opposed to pulps. Um, but I mean, we've generally found dealing with SGS or ALS or whoever it is, it, when you point out a problem, they're quite happy to look at it with you and say, yeah, okay. Um, I seem to remember it was either Lula or Marilla. We, we found there was a definite um, undervaluation of about 5% when you look at all the standards and they were quite happy to repeat those and, and that's when we went to doing um, the uh, gravity uh, finish rather than AA on any samples above five grams a ton. So we just had this procedure if the AA result came back at over five grams a ton then you repeated it using, um, uh, using it a, a gravity finish. But yeah, I, I agree there's um, a tendency for a lot of geologists not to understand geochemistry and not to want to understand it, similar to geophysics sometimes. And um, I think a lot of stuff has been missed. Um, I'm working um, with a company at the moment in uh, the Golden Triangle up in Canada, um, in BC. And boy, there's so much stuff around there um, that in the past people have looked at, walked over, and you know you come around 10, 20 years later, look at their data and um, <laughs> things end for you. Yeah, mm -hmm. fantastic. Okay, it, 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 George answer. Henry had a George Henry had a hand up. Okay, and then we'll go to Ed Cable. Thanks. Thank you, you very much for an interesting talk, Keith. Um, uh, you mentioned that you uh, did some work in uh, West Africa around Marilla. Now. Um, uh, were you trying to do the a stream sediment sampling um, in that area? No, or no, no, no. Just small sampling? Uh, no, Marilla was a totally different exercise. It was actually a research exercise, and, and, and sadly, it was never finished. It gained, uh, one of the things we found with Marilla is that the composition of the biotite in the rock, you see, I had access to electron microprobe, you know, in Anglo, we had everything. <laughs> we discovered that uh, the, the composition of the biotite in the gold bearing rocks compared to the non-gold bearing rocks, which are identical, is different. The magnesium iron ratio is different. And uh, we never got to the bottom of to why that is, because that's quite an important piece of information to use if you want your drilling to actually look at the biotite to actually target where the gold will be and where it won't be. It was, it, that's what we did. But most of, most of the work I did in, in, in West Africa was uh, working on the, a mapping of regolith and developing techniques of understanding the various components of the regolith uh, 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 in terms of the residual, the, the erosional, and uh, transported, and the positional environments of the regular, and dividing the chemist, geochemistry up in, in, in those terms, and also the role of mapping uh, 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 rab holes, and working out where the uh, transition with the redox boundary is in the laterite, all those kind of things. And that kind of data, with it's, it's a huge amount of data again, and normally a lot of the operation geologists don't have the time 
to actually assess that data. I spent a lot of time assessing that data. And let me tell you, on, on Sadiola, there was some amazing stuff. Really, really good stuff. And I will argue that there are deposits around Sadiola, which they still haven't found. Okay. Because that right is hiding a whole story. Uh, thank you. Okay, let's have Ed. Ed, you, we've had a lot of um, comments made about laboratories. Do you want to chip in from a lab point of view and your years and years of experience in running labs? No, I, th I, th I think what um, Keith has come up with is um, spot on. Um, it certainly is, is the way to operate. And uh, just adjust, I agree. Your, adjust your screen a bit. We got half your face. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there that better? Yeah, you look much better now. Thank you. Sorry, Ed, um, you're gone. Am I gone? <laughs> no, you're there, don't worry. Um, Keith, just an interesting one there. Um, you were talking about uh, the association of bismuth and tellurium. Did you pick up anything on, on the arsenic antimony front? Keith? Keith, Keith can you, you hear that? I think he's gone frozen. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like it. We'll give him a minute. Um... Hello, Keith. Calling Keith. Keith. <laughs> Ground control to Keith. <laughs> I'll run up. The, I'll run up the street quickly and wake him up. <laughs> You're just down the road, are you, John? Yeah, we're three hours down the road. So, yeah, so we've got. Uh, why? Why do we wait for Keith? To, uh, um, what is the sort of standard these days for making sure that the guys collecting the samples remain honest? I'm sorry, uh, Henny, I, I, I missed that. I'm saying, how do we keep the guys collecting the, the samples honest these days? What is the accepted standard method of, of putting in a check? Um, no, you've, you've, you've got me on that one. I, uh, I've been out of that uh, scenario for the past uh, 12 years, so I'm not sure what the current situation is, Amy. What, what um, was it in your day? Um, you mean when, when actually sampling in the field and, and uh, submitting those samples through to the lab? Correct. Oh. I know, so, uh, you know, I, I recall way back when I was in exploration, yes. the field of, you know, we, some of the guys would sit under a tree and sample all around the tree. So we had to, you know, we had right, to bring yes. a check system when we put traces in and they were numbered and, you know, the, and, and we, we advised the laboratory, you know, which ones they were or they would, or, the, and, or a check both sides. It checked that the laboratories were doing their job and also that the, the guys collecting it were doing theirs. So I'm just saying, you know, has that evolved into something more, more finer these days? Or maybe um, the guy who just spoke to us just now can, can enlighten us on that one. Uh, maybe, maybe Guy can. Um, I, I can't. I do recall the, the story about sitting around a tree collecting samples as opposed to following grid lines. Um, Henny. Um, I worked on a project in Gabon many years ago where we got access to the UNDP data for one in 200,000 sheets. So big project and it kind of halfway through taking their data and making some sense out of it when we started hearing this story about well you mustn't believe any of that stuff because the geologists, well not the geologists, the soil samplers used to sit under a tree and just collect from there. But when you actually process the data um, and you look at the copper and zinc and iron and so on, th these things follow the geology. They follow the different units. You can, you can map a one in 200,000 sheet just by looking to some extent at the geochemistry. So, you know, we, we then said, well, there might have been a few people sitting under a tree, but the majority of the work, and, you know, it was a big regional study, the majority of the work is valid because it, it ties in with the geology. Um, the, the other thing is the, the, what do they call it? The chain of custody now. Um, after the BRIAC scandal, that's, you'll see the reporting in, in the 43101s. They're very precise about how samples were, were taken, 
how they were transported, how they were stored in the camp, how they were treated there in any way, if they were treated there, and then from there on how they were carried to, to the laboratory. And, you know, it's that chain of custody to make sure that people aren't salting along the way or, or whatever. So it is generally quite rigorous. Um, you know, when it, when it comes to um, people cheating, there's no ways you can keep up with them. But uh, I would say it's, you know, very seldom done these days. And if guys are sitting under a tree, well, you know, I guess you, you'll catch most of them, but it, it, it's human nature to do that kind of thing with certain humans. And if you look at the data properly, you, you'll see where something is wrong. I mean, Briex was a, a great case. If people had, had looked at the geochem data, they'd see that it didn't fit any sort of normal or log normal distribution. It was all over the oh. place because the guys salting it were just pouring in grains of gold in the places that they thought might be a good idea, but there was no um, natural distribution to it at all. Um, so you look at the data properly, which is where geochemists come in, and um, you know, you, you'll pick up that kind of thing. Yeah, Adrian, I think you make a, a key point. Sorry if I can butt in there, Ed. I mean, it, it goes back to knowing the geology, doing the basic geology. You know, if you've done the geology, even if there is cover or regolith, you, you know, and you get out there and beat the rocks, I think a lot of those things can be overcome. You know, it's when you sit in front of a computer screen and never actually get out in the field, which I think is, is part of the problem these days, you miss the geology. And without the geology, you're going to run into problems. Yeah, no, I right. concur with, with, with Adrian in terms of um, traceability and so on. Once you've collected the sample, then it's an easy matter of keeping track of that, of the, the batch of samples that are then submitted to, to the laboratory. So that there is a chain of custody from that point. Um, in the actual field where you're collecting samples, unless you've got somebody overseeing in individual sample taking, that, that is an issue. And this comes back to collecting the samples around a tree instead of actually following grid lines. Is uh, Keith yeah. still uh, away at this point in time, John? Yeah, I just spoke to him. He's, I think his system is bombed. So I said I would pass on the hard questions to him and I'll, I'll, I'll run up the road with a piece of paper a bit later and then he can respond to people who are asking the hard questions. Right. Have, we got, um, have we got any other general, general points for discussion? It's been, it's been a good one and I must say credit to Keith for a short stimulating um, presentation. Yes, uh, John, I'd like to thank Keith for an excellent presentation and some yeah. very good ideas in the uh, situation of collecting samples. I, I yeah. think it's a brilliant, uh, brilliant uh, presentation. Thanks yeah, very great. much indeed. It's just the, the Brisbane Tellurium story. If you could follow up on the arsenic and antimony, that'd be great. Okay, I'll get them to respond to you. <laughs> right, thanks. And, and any other questions, guys, Henny? Um, basically, I just want to sort of set the record there that did not all the guys get lazy out there. I was one of the guys I can recall working for the beers with my landing out, and then you've got a grid that you've got to oh, keep back. They pre decided where you're going to, and one of the samples was, I recall very vividly, was on top of a coffee at, you know, next to the, the twig beacon. And Is that I the one you had to walk up, Henny, and it was in the hot midday sun? No, then I decided I'm going to drive up there. So I, I actually <laughs> said to the guys, look, this is a voluntary trip. And they all stuck initially with me. But as we went up, the sea started abandoning. They started bailing off the back of the of the Land Rover until it was only me and the guy next to me because he couldn't get out inside. So ended up at the top, took the sample exactly where it should be taken, you know, so Apart from then us writing on the maps BFR and then head office would come back and say, what kind of geology are you talking about now? And we say it stands for big flip and rocks, you know, type of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, this Everybody, is I'm back. From the okay, let, let, let um, Keith, Keith um, Ed, Ed had a few comments. In fact, um, the most important one is he really appreciated your excellent presentation. Ed, do you want to chip in and ask about the other question? Yes, thanks, John. Uh, hi, Keith. Um, you talked about bismuth and tellurium. 
Um, what were the patterns with arsenic and antimony? Did they follow similar trends? They, they, all three, those, and that was a, the big problem when I showed those maps, is the arsenic values around that neck of the woods are quite high. They're sort of in excess of a thousand ppm and so are copper. Whereas the tellurium oh, and bismuth yeah. are sort of fractions of PP, ppm compared to that, they're about a, sort of a hundred. That's why I work with the percentile maps. And that multi-element data, it's the only way to work with it, is to convert everything to percentiles. And I've got software that does it, plots the stuff. Um, I used uh, GeoSoft Target to plot it, and you get the most amazing maps. The trouble is you've got so many maps, and the only way to actually look at them properly is not on a screen, but actually print them. So it uses, you need a big printer. So you can lay these maps out and then draw them with a pencil. You, you, the, the, the visualization on the screen narrows everything down too much. You actually need a big A naught sheet of maps and lots of them. Right. And then you can actually map out these things and then um, uh, uh, re uh, uh, geo reference the marks that you put on the map. And you see the most amazing things come out and they can direct the geochemistry, which this is what's not being done. Is the geochemistry and the geochemistry, geochemical prospecting is not being directed to the most promising areas. It's almost being done blindly. The worst case scenario is in Amazon and Brazil, where they just put down grids. You know, that's not the way to do it. You've got to actually target the areas uh, um, a bit more accurately that and use the geology mm -hmm. and understand the regolith. If you don't understand the regolith, and particularly the guys in Mali, they know, they know how much uh, uh, regolith mapping plays in actually understanding the geochemistry. Then when you've got the geochemistry and all that multi-element data, you've got to subset it so you can actually use it because the, the, the dispersion anomalies for some of these gold deposits is actually surprisingly small. Mm. Yeah, Keith, we just right, made that. Much. Yeah. Keith, we made that point exactly that unless you get out there and do the geology, um, you know, grids grids have limitations. So all of this goes back to the point you made too. You've got to get on the ground and hit the rocks, you know, or or deal with the regolith. You can't just do it from a laptop in a distance. Anyway, that was a very simulating yes. talk. Good stuff. Well, Any other questions? Can I, Gert, can I ask a very simple layman's question? You said, Keith, that in Alaska, there's a lot of dust and a very little weathering of the rocks. Doesn't that upset the sampling? It does. It's tremendously upsetting. You see, that's glacial dust. That's the stuff, stuff. The glaciers grind off the rocks underneath. And then it's dispersed all over the place. So a lot of the dust that you're dealing with doesn't actually come from where the sample comes from that you're taking. So it obscures things. So you have to work out which part of the sample is going to be least affected by that glacial dust. The other thing you have to do is to map the glacial dust like we did with the regolith in, in, in Mali. That's where I learned a lot of this stuff, was working in Mali. We, it's, it's no longer a, a, a laterite, it's now a glacial terrain, but the same principles are, are, apply. You've got to identify the... And, and how do you separate it? And then do the how do you separate the glacial dust from the others? From, well, first of all, you map out where the glacial dust is. So you, the samples that are badly affected with glacial dust, you know that. So you actually got to go down and sample the bedrock, not the glacial dust. That's what you use the auger for. Okay? okay. And you've got a sample right at the bottom. So you, you don't just take a pit. You know, often, and this is a lot of geochemistry is done in South Africa. We were terrible at it. I mean, they were sampling around Barberton, and every pit was the same depth. Same place, sometimes uh, 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 it, it was the, the overburden was very thin. So they never took that into account that uh, thin overburden over rock outcrop and thick overburden is two different environments. They should be mapped out. But it, it was only in the case of laterite where we actually got it right. And that was because of the work done at, at, in uh, 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 at Syro in Australia by people like Charles Butt and Ravi Anand, where they actually started to understand the laterite. And then we took those principles, in, which we used in that time, we took them everywhere and learned to a subset the, the, the environment, the sampling environment, so that we could actually use the, ge uh, the geochemistry over areas where the bedrock is, uh, 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 is close to the surface, is quite different to where there's thick overburden and might be a glacial dust diluted with alluvium. So, so it's, it's, it's you, quite a, you be mapping the glacial striations to then get a direction from where it, the hinterland from where it might be coming from. Wouldn't that be an aid in your exploration? No, not, not in Alaska, because you can actually see the glacier. You know, you can, you can see where it's coming from. 
and we can't no. you know we can we know where the glaciers are i mean we, a lot of the stuff is outwash as well and when these glaciers recede in in the summertime and summers are quite dry in alaska this dust that's left it actually blows and forms sand dunes i can show you pictures of sand dunes i'll be getting a narrow and just okay. covered with musk and with moss interesting okay any more questions folks okay thanks right i think we've run up okay and you've got you've got the tape penny you taped it successfully this morning yes uh, we've got it there with all uh, here and there a little bit of a hiccup where the fine gold was edited out by the cloud but uh, okay. i think the, the major part of the speech was there and it's going to be available for the next week or so guys yeah, and, and keith you happy to distribute a pdf of your talk as well um yeah uh, can i distribute that pdf i just need to edit out one or two things in case i'm pointing fingers at people i don't like pointing fingers at people. <laughs> 